wants to introduce myself. My name is Andy Oberbach from Leipzig, Fraunhofer Institute. And I'm Vivek Kumbari. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at, uh, for the Division of Gastroenterology at, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and uh, I'm very proud to have worked with Andy on some very interesting work that we are delighted to be able to, to talk about today. So I thought I'd start off by introducing the, the concept of our study. Uh, in fact, our study is a logical progression on some prior work we did uh, looking at gastric mucosal devitalization uh, in an obese rat model. Uh, so just a quick recap of that work. Uh, we did a randomized controlled trial uh, looking at obese rats and compared this concept of gastric mucosal devitalization using argon plasma coagulation, a standard technology that we use very commonly in endoscopy, and compared it to a sham cohort as well as a sleeve gastrectomy cohort. And uh, would you like to describe the results of that, uh, that rat study? The rat study, it f the first result was we saw a significant weight reduction in the GMD cohort compared to sleeve cohort and compared to shame. And this was actually very surprising because there was no difference between sleeve cohort and the GMD cohort. I think in addition to, to, the, to the weight loss findings, we found that uh, GMD uh, resulted in significant less uh, oral intake, uh, improved uh, cholesterol and glucose homeostasis, and in fact, when you looked at tissue adiposity, there was also a significant reduction. So yes. based on the promising results of our, of our rodent work, we decided to progress to a, a, a large animal model. Uh, and so we thought, you know, p pigs are often utilized in, uh, in endoscopy. Uh, they have very similar GI anatomy to that of humans. And so we used a, a German species of pig, which has a relatively high uh, body fat content. As you're probably aware, pigs, by, by the, pigs that are bred commercially by very nature uh, are muscular and are not, uh, don't have a significant amount of adiposity. But we found this particular breed uh, that had a, a, a reasonable amount of adiposity. And we thought we'd perform uh, another randomized controlled trial comparing GMD uh, to a sham cohort to a surgical sleeve cohort. And uh, it's very rare that you have uh, you know, large animal studies, which in fact are a randomized control studies, uh, looking at a surgical arm. So we were, were determined to rigorously test uh, our method uh, to you know, uh, um, you know, one of the gold standard uh, metabolic therapies. And we plan to be very close on uh, the clinical trial actually you use in uh, sleeve gastrectomy. So therefore we uh, invited one colleague of Leipzig who do the sleeve gastrectomy procedure, and he's very an, ex, an ex expert in those procedures. So and we start to compare this procedure by using the expertise of Vivek Kombarik and do GMD. So I think what we, what we really wanted to do is uh, ascertain whether it was technically possible uh, and safe to perform gastric mucosal devitalization or GMD in a, uh, a human-sized large animal model. Uh, we'd proven that there was some scientific basis to pursue GMD and really want to see if it was technically feasible using standard endoscopic equipment. Uh, so we used pigs that were 30 to 35 kilos uh, and randomized them uh, uh, with, uh, with seven in each group to GMD, sham, and, and sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, and we did this in a, in a rigorous uh, setting. Uh, all the uh, endoscopic procedures were performed by myself and all the surgical sleeve procedures were performed by uh, you know, an, a, a, a bariatric surgeon. Uh, and with regards to the GMD procedure, we used uh, a 510K cleared equipment, so equipment that's available throughout Europe and the US. Uh, we decided uh, to perform the GMD procedure in a similar fashion as to how we foresee this being done uh, when we move to humans. And so what we did is we, we did a submucosal injection of the entire gastric body and fundus, uh, and then after the submucosal lift with, uh, with a a needleless injecting system, we did ablation using argon plasma coagulation. Uh, as you're aware, uh, the gastric mucosa in pigs is significantly thicker uh, than that of humans, so the dosing required for APC uh, is, is higher than I suspect we'll need for the human setting. Uh, but we ablated until we saw a sort of golden brown color, and that was our uh, marker of, of sufficient ablation. And we found that it was technically possible to, to ablate in a large surface area of the stomach using this technique, and it took you know, anywhere between 60 uh, to 90 minutes in our, uh, in our cohort of pigs. Uh, it was nice, the pigs sort of tolerated the procedure very well, 
Uh, they were upright that night. They didn't show any signs of distress. Uh, and they were uh, followed for eight weeks. And we, did a, we followed a very similar protocol from, from the sham group uh, where they were, uh, and a surgical group who went and had a surgical sleeve, again, tolerated the surgical procedure very well. Uh, and all three groups had the same uh, post-procedure uh, diet. Uh, and, so, uh, and then they were fed at libitum for eight weeks. And, and so we, uh, uh, we, we did weights on a weekly basis uh, th throughout that eight-week period. And uh, maybe I'll ask Andy to share some of the, the weight results and the MRI results that we, uh, that we Yeah, ad additionally we did MRI scan because we were interested to see how the adipose tissue, especially the visceral adipose tissue, was changed over the pr procedure over eight weeks. And it was very exciting that we saw that um, there was no significant difference between sleeve gastrectomy and GMD over eight weeks in visceral adipose tissue compared to shame, which have a significant higher level of um, uh, adipose tissue. Uh, additionally, we were interested in, and we are looking for really hard endpoints, therefore we looked on the tissue lipid content, and we also found uh, very exciting results that the lipid droplets on liver, on skeletal muscle, heart muscle, were significant lower in GMD compared to uh, shame. I mean, this is particularly exciting. I mean, one of our, you know, there, there were several endpoints that we had in the study, and, and one of them was to assess uh, if there was any reduction in weight gain as a result of GMD compared to the sham group. And we're also curious to see how this compared to, to the surgical group. Uh, and so we found that uh, the body weight gain was less in the GMD group at four weeks and eight weeks compared to the sham cohort. Uh, and, and interestingly, we found that body weight gain was similar between GMD yeah. and sleeve gastrectomy at four weeks, although there did appear to be a trend uh, for superiority of sleeve gastrectomy at eight weeks. And we proposed that uh, maybe it, uh, you know, within the first four weeks, due to the sufficient uh, ablation or devitalization of the gastric mucosa, um, it, you know, regeneration started to occur uh, sort of at four weeks, and therefore that may have resulted in the... Uh, the, the differentiation between the two groups at eight weeks. But I think it was particularly exciting to, to see such a dramatic uh, reduction in weight gain between uh, the GMD group and the sham group. Um, and obviously, you know, following, you know, looking at tissue lipid content, uh, so it was remarkable that we were able to, to demonstrate a reduction in tissue lipid content. And obviously our MRI findings looked at both subcutaneous It's correlated very strongly, yeah. It did. It so our MRI findings also showing subcutaneous and visceral yeah. adiposity reduction in the GMD group compared to the, the sham group. Uh, and, and in fact, the fact that the visceral adiposity was similar uh, in GMD and yeah. sleeve gastrectomy at eight weeks is remarkable. Really a testament that, you know, GMD seems to be a... Uh, a metabolic procedure, not just a weight loss procedure, which is, I think, the, the ultimate goal uh, when, when trying to innovate uh, endoscopic bariatric uh, procedures. Especially if you think on people, on obese people, which are linked to comorbidities, you know, like heart failure or whatever, you need a procedure which is not so invasive compared to a uh, sleeve gastrectomy. So it's very promising now. It is. So I think now that we've demonstrated um, technical feasibility, safety, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and efficacy, uh, I think now the, the next step we've decided is to move to, to clinical trials. And uh, I'll describe very briefly our, our thoughts on that and, and how we foresee that, that developing. Um, but uh, just before I do that, I thought I'd mention briefly some of the histological findings. You know, often uh, people ask us, you know, um, okay, fine, if you're able to successfully ablate large volumes of the stomach, you know, how, is, uh, how does the stomach look? Uh, at eight weeks. Uh, and in fact, when, when, we, when we looked at the gross specimens, uh, we did see um, that there was mucosal regeneration at eight weeks, which is something that we would expect. Uh, but we, uh, we found that histologically there was no ulceration, but there was a little bit of scarring uh, at, the, uh, at the watershed territory from a vascular perspective, perspective between the, the gastric body and fundus. And I, and I think we, we, we accept that there's going to be a little bit of scarring here, and, and we, may have, uh, we may be able to dial back some of the dosing in humans and, uh, and find that we, we, we may or we may not suffer uh, that, that same challenge. Um, uh, and also when we looked at uh, hormonal data, Hormones, we looked yeah. at uh, Im uh, some immunofluorescence for, for, for ghrelin staining and, and you may want to describe what we saw there. 
What we saw was also surprising because after eight weeks we saw a significant reduction of those ghrelin cells and um, this is a, this shows that is not a recovery of those cells compared to before. It's interesting. I think we see this in, in inflammatory bowel yes. disease as well, where you have histological regeneration of tissue, but you may not have the uh, hormonal secreting capacity of that tissue uh, re respond or rebound, yeah. uh, you know, in, in a similar fashion. So I think that, that you know, when, when we, we think there may be some element of durability to the procedure that uh, that extends beyond just histological regeneration. Um, you know, so Andy, I'd be interested in your thoughts as to where you you see this going from here. Are we are we ready to go straight to humans, or is there, uh, you know, what what uh, maybe you want to describe what we've discussed as as the next best steps? Well, I think the next step must be to go in humans. A safety trial, for an example. Uh, this is very consequent. We have to do this, and then let's see what happens in a clinical trial. It's actually. Yeah, and I think we're, uh, you know, we, we plan to start that soon. Uh, we, uh, we're going to look at some dose finding work uh, using human tissue. Uh, that's important. And then we're going, going on to do some safety and efficacy studies. I think when you, when you, seek, when you speak to patients who want to undergo a, a bariatric therapy, and certainly the FDA feels uh, very strongly about this, that safety is paramount. And so I think we want to, uh, we want to, uh, to do this logically and safely. And so we, we'll do some dose finding studies and see if we can find a minimum threshold uh, of ablation such that we get good efficacy and metabolic improvements uh, without, uh, without affecting tolerability or, um, uh, or, uh, or, or any significant change. Um, so I think we, we're very uh, uh, happy that we got the opportunity to, to talk to you today about the work we've done. We were obviously very passionate and excited <laughs> and, and particularly uh, you know, uh, uh, are excited to help you present the results of our, of our clinical data uh, you know, over the coming years as, as it presents. They might sign off there, so thanks very much. Thank you very much.